Hi, I'm Rebecca Bach Carcel. Let's take a close look at the poem The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. Already with the title, we get the sense that this man, who is speaking to us in a dramatic monologue, is unusual. He's awkward, and his name is a little stilted and strange. It doesn't flow musically or melodically, and that turns out to be true of this man who is speaking to us in the poem. Now, even uh, before the first line of the poem, we have a little section from Dante's Inferno. Now, Dante goes into hell and sees things and talks to people and then comes back out. This passage is from a soul that's in hell who speaks to Dante, figuring nobody ever leaves hell, so it's okay if I just tell my whole story to Dante, because no one will ever know about it. It turns out he's wrong, and Dante does tell about it and embarrass this man. So embarrassment is one of the emotions that we'll see in the poem. But even more important than that is the idea that Dante has been in a remote underworld and wants to come back and tell something, but the secrets of that underworld are normally kept hidden. And I think the secrets that this man carries around about who he really is or about what he thinks, his intellectual life, he keeps it all a secret. And he doesn't tell it, and he doesn't live a social public life it's all hidden. So that's some of the relationship between this Dante passage and the poem. And there's more to say about that. And people have written papers about just that. But that's enough to get us started. So let's move into the poem. It starts out addressing the reader. Let us go then, you and I. So he's saying, okay, come on with me. When the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. This is not a very pleasant image for the end of a day or the sunset. It's a, a patient etherized on the table is an inert body, you know, a body without liveliness, without consciousness. It's deadened, even though it's not all the way dead. And so this is an image that sets up a tone of bleakness and that continues he says let us go through certain half deserted streets the muttering retreats of restless nights in one night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells now here he's describing some of the things along their their walk we're going to go past these one night cheap hotels and these sawdust restaurants, which would have a floor of sawdust. They'd put sawdust on the floor so that they could just sweep out all the grime and gunk that collects on the floor. So the sawdust tells us that these are not fancy establishments. This is kind of a seedy part of town. Now they, they continue on, the you and I, to these streets. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. Okay, so now we know that they're going to walk through these streets and then visit somebody. All right, but the streets are half deserted. Uh, they have these seedy restaurants and the streets are like a tedious argument. So they wander around, they don't really go anywhere. And again, we have that feeling of bleakness and not, not hopefulness, this purposelessness. And now they're going to uh, go and make their visit. But first there's this reference to an overwhelming question. And that is referred to again throughout the poem. So one of the questions uh, we readers have is, what is that question? And Eliot does not tell us directly what that question is. He just says that the streets follow like a tedious argument, a line of reasoning that is tangled, of insidious intent, so this is of, of bad intent, to lead you to an overwhelming question. Hmm. So somehow the conversation or this, this argument 
which is not a fighting argument, but more like a line of reasoning, it leads to some overwhelming question. And what that is, we can explore. Okay. Next stanza. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And this line gets repeated. It's a little refrain. It's almost like a little song in the middle here. And he is describing where it is they're visiting. So they're in a place where women are going by, and they're talking about an artist. You know, Michelangelo is a famous artist. But these women are not academics or artists themselves. It's just fashionable to speak of artists, you know, the like kind of like name dropping, oh, pretending to know a lot about art. Maybe they really don't. It's sort of a show, a social play that they all participate in. Now he describes the yellow fog. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes. Okay, so now the smoke is like an animal that has a muzzle. Licked its tongue into the corners of the evening. Very creative. So it seems mostly like a cat here. Lingered upon the pools that stand in drains. Let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys. Slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. Now this is all personification, or or if it's a cat, then it's a catification describing fog or yellow smoke. So again, we're in a not pretty, not picturesque part of the city. It's uh, yellow because it's industrial, and even though the cat imagery is kind of interesting and creative, it's not really a happy image. And we have the fog all the way up from the sky and then down into the pools and the drains. So we're moving from looking at the sky down into the, onto the ground. And indeed, there will be time he says, for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes, there will be time. There will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. All right, now this line about there will be time refers to another poem that talks about time and is trying to hurry time along. But here he keeps insisting there will be time as if there's always more time. And he says that in that extra time we have, there's time for that fog and that smoke to wander around some more. And we have wonderful language here as far as the smoke rubbing its back on the window panes. But then it says to prepare, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. And he's talking about how when you go into a social situation, you prepare your face. So you either prepare a persona through which you will be speaking and and acting. You know, okay, I'm going to pretend to be cheerful even though I don't feel that great right now. Or maybe you prepare a face as in you, you decide you're going to be polite even though that may not be strictly how you feel about these people or about this event. You're going to make the best of it. You're going to, you know, be a good sport when in fact maybe you don't really want to be there. And all of us have had to do this in our social lives, visit people we don't really want to see, etc. So here he is making this visit, and he spends a lot of time talking about the fog and the smoke, none of which sounds very happy. It's rather industrial and dark. And now he goes on. He says, There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Okay, so there will be time to murder and create. So this is about things that he actually wants to do with life, to, to uh, create. Murder, I guess we have the constant destruction and creation as a theme in, uh, in a creative life or, or even in our own psychological life. We murder parts of ourselves or bad habits and then we create ourselves anew we get rid of old identities and and form new ones and i think that is part of what he's saying here now 
all through here there's more interpretations there's different ways to read it so this is just one take on it okay um, but that's what I think of when I read that line in time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate so all the things you might do in a day the the works that you would accomplish with your hands or whatever and then it drops a question on your plate um, so now we're mentioning a question again time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea a toast and tea makes me think that this gathering this visit might be a tea party or it may just be a gathering that has tea available you know but notice how he says there's time for you and time for me. So he's speaking either to the reader again, or maybe by now the you is feeling more like a companion that he's speaking to. And if he's speaking to the companion, then maybe we're just overhearing this whole conversation between two people, even though the one is doing all the talking. Uh, if it's the reader, though, then he's saying, well, you know, reader, there'll be time for you and I to have an exchange that is meaningful at some stage. But right now, we have to be polite in all of this tea party stuff. Now, he also says time for a hundred indecisions. And indecision seems to be one of the traits of this speaker here. He doesn't make decisions. He There's this overwhelming question. We don't know what it is. There's this worry about going to this place, the, all this imagery that's uncomfortable and bleak, and indecision is what he's thinking about, not being able to make a decision, not being able to act. And he's thinking of a hundred visions and revisions. So planning to do something but then changing his mind or setting out on one direction and then deciding to go another direction. So he's not secure, he's not confident, and we can see that in these lines. Then we have the, the Michelangelo line again. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. So while he's been thinking about visions and revisions, the women are still doing their artist talk and so on. So he's not participating in this visit. So far, he hasn't met anyone, he hasn't talked to anyone. All of this is happening mostly in his head, and we're overhearing his thinking. At some point, you hope he'll actually start to do something at this visit. Let's see. And indeed, there will be time. So he says this again. He's, he has a thing about time, I guess. He thinks that, um, that there's always a little more time. There will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie, rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his leg, arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. All right, so let's go back and see what he said there. Uh, he says, I, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? So there's something he wants to do here at this social event. Do I dare, though? He is nervous about it. He is insecure. He doesn't know if he should go ahead with it, whatever it is. And then he thinks, well, wait, but there's time to turn back and descend the stairs. So we're going down again, descending. And he's nervous that people will comment on the bald spot in on his head and that they'll they'll think he looks bad you know that he looks maybe that he looks old and even though he feels like he's dressed all right my necktie and I've got this pin now that's not enough because people are going to say gosh he's growing thin so he's worried about what people think of him he's worried about looking a little silly stupid old he thinks he's not impressive according to him. Now, maybe he's just paranoid, 
and everybody thinks he looks fine, and they're not even thinking about his bald spot and so on. But he's obsessing about it. So he notices little details, and he's worried that he'll be judged by the little detail of his hair in this social situation. So, poor guy. Now, the next stanza. For I have known them all already, meaning all the people, all, all this whole situation at this gathering, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? So here he says, I'm familiar with all of this. I've known the mornings, the evenings, the afternoons. I've done all these stupid parties quite a lot. Uh, and he says, I've measured my life with coffee spoons, which is a famous line and quite original. It's as if he's just always at these coffee things and one more spoonful of sugar or one more stir of milk. And boy, that's his whole life. It feels like these social gatherings are constant. Then he says, I know the voices dying with a dying fall. Now here's mention of dying. And you notice how we've had descent, descending the stair. We've had the beginning where Dante is in hell. There's this kind of downward motion of the poem. And I think when he says uh, the dying fall, we have another sort of descending idea that people's voices in the other room sound like ending, not at a fresh beginning, but a dying fall. He doesn't hear the exact words, perhaps. Maybe he's hearing just the music of the voices, but they seem to be dying. They seem to be ending, descending. And that's not a very happy image either. Now he says beneath, uh, this is beneath the music. He hears these voices. So how should I presume? So now he's questioning himself some more. Like, should I do this thing? How should I presume. Why would I be so presumptuous as to go ahead and do this thing or ask this question, whatever it is that he is there to do? And he's questioning himself, doubting himself. And I have known the eyes already. All right, so he talks about how he's already known these events. Now he's focusing just on the eyes of people. I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? So again, he's imagining trying to be in a conversation with someone, but he knows that they always pin him to the wall. So they'll ask some kind of formulated phrase. Maybe they'll say something, a, a pleasantry, that's not a real question, or a, a, he feels like it's a superficial exchange. And then he is going to feel like he's sprawled on a pin. And a pin is used for putting insects on a card or something to study. So he feels like he's being scrutinized, studied, analyzed, and he doesn't feel at liberty to express himself, not for real. He says, how should I begin to, to, to spit out all about my life, the butt ends of my days and ways? It Butt ends doesn't sound like it's very pleasant. He thinks that, that what his days and ways are would not make good conversation, that, that people don't want to hear about his days and ways. He says, how should I presume? How should I talk about that? Do, do they want to know that? He cannot find a way to engage with people in this setting. Next stanza, and I have known the arms already. Now, instead of talking about whole people, he talks about the eyes, and now here we go to the arms. And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair, is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl, and should I then presume? And how should I begin? All right, so he's talking about women here. Women's arms, he's noticed them very particularly. He's noticed the hair on their arms. He notices the perfume from a dress, and he's thinking, well, maybe that's why I can't talk. 
I, it makes me digress. It makes me lose my train of thought. So maybe this shows that he's attracted to these women and that's why he's intimidated and can't figure out what to say. He's observing the women very closely and that they make him nervous. And then he says, how should I presume and how should I begin? He doesn't even know how to try to tell these women about who he is or what his life is like. Next stanza. Shall I say... I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. Uh, that doesn't sound like a great conversation starter, does it? He's thinking, well, that's something I could say, but he knows that that isn't what people want to talk about. So in the next section, he says, I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. So again, he puts himself in a subterranean level, down, down, down. That's where he's thinking it makes sense for him to be. I should just be like a crab, you know, with claws. and I'm so awkward. I'm so weird. Nobody wants to talk about what I want to talk about, or no one will be interested in what I have to say. And the afternoon, the evening, sleep so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. So again, he's using animal language or personification to talk about how the evening sleeps peacefully. And the, the evening, instead of being an etherized patient, now the evening is, a, is lying down on the floor, between you and me. So either between the reader and the speaker here, or between this companion that he's talking to. But the evening, he says it sleeps peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, which is kind of pleasant, kind of relaxing. But then it says asleep, tired, or it malingers. Now malingering is something I associate with illness or people pretending to have an illness and lying around uh, lazily and, you know, trying to get out of doing their work. So that's a negative word to throw in with this peaceful image. So we don't really get a nice peaceful image. After all, the evening is possibly malingering, so we don't entirely trust its peaceful sleep and it's stretched out on the floor here beside you and me. Well, what does that mean? I think maybe he's referring to a time after this social tea party thing. He doesn't know how he should feel about how the social thing went. Then he says, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? Okay, so at the event, there's tea, cakes, ices, should I have forced the moment to its crisis? So he meant to do something and take some action or say something that would have forced the moment to a crisis, that would have created some tension here and caused something to happen, but he didn't do it. <laughs> It says, uh, but though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, let's not forget, brought in upon a platter, and that's a reference to John the Baptist, though that has all happened, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker. So he says, okay, even though I have wept and prayed and and now I'm older with my bald head, or slightly bald, I'm not doing all this suffering to be a martyr, to be a prophet, even though I feel persecuted like John the Baptist, in maybe because socially he feels persecuted, or he doesn't fit in with society the same way that a prophet doesn't fit in. He still says, I'm not a prophet, and I've seen the moment of my greatness flicker. So even the potential he could have had to be great, it has flickered. It wasn't just strong and shining. It has weakened and shifted and flickered. So it, that's not happening anymore. All right, now we still have a ways to go. <laughs> Let's see. 
and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. Now, I apologize for not reading that together because flicker and snicker go together, rhyme. But now we have yet another death image. The eternal footman holds my coat. That's like death is standing there saying, ah, right, come this way, sir, to death, you know. And not only is he ushering him to death, but he's snickering. So that's like laughing, making fun of him as if his life is a joke or, or maybe his death is a joke. Again, he is questioning his worth or the worth of his life. He's feeling like even death is going to laugh at his expense. Now, he's going to look back a bit. And would it have been worth it, after all? After the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it toward some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, and I shall tell you all, if one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. Okay, help, <laughs> let's go back. He's questioning whether it would have been worth it after all of that cakes, marmalade, okay, in, at the gathering, and some talk of you and me, the companion, or the reader become the companion, would it have been worth it to have bitten off the matter with a smile? So what does that mean? What do, He means, should I have gone ahead and talked about it, and smiled, and put forward this thing that I'm not saying, and this thing that he was too afraid to say. In fact, he says earlier, in short, I was afraid. He's been afraid to be himself, in especially in society. And here he's saying, well, okay, what if I had gone ahead and said it, and bitten off the matter with a smile, and squeezed the universe into a ball? It would take such a effort to do that, but, but it would be such a grand thing. He, it would be like squeezing the universe into a ball and roll it to the overwhelming question. So again, we have this overwhelming question. What is that question? Is the question the thing he can't say? He has a question to ask and he won't ask it. Uh, he's mentioned women and, and uh, the fascination he has with women. Is it about the women? Maybe he wants to marry one of these women. Is it that he can't ask her to marry him? Is that the question? Or is it more of a question that would challenge the situation, you know, that would that would shatter this oh-so-polite, uh, superficial thing and make it a deeper situation or make it a more genuine situation if he were just himself, you know? Maybe that's what it would take, is to roll the universe into a ball and... Well, then he says an example of something he might say. Like, what if I said, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, and I have something to tell you. Now, again, we have the mention of death and dead. So Lazarus in the Bible is brought back to life by Jesus. Lazarus has been to wherever after death is and is able to come back and say something about where he's been. So maybe Prufrock is saying, I have something to tell all of you about my, my journeys. Maybe they're creative journeys, maybe they're artistic journeys. Maybe he's seen death in some way because of his experience in life. But whatever it is, he compares himself to Lazarus, who's been dead but now is alive and now has something to say. But then he says, would it have been worth it to try to say that if a woman would just settle a pillow by her head and say, oh, that's not what I meant at all. So maybe he's saying that every time these women will ask him a question or try to get him to talk, if he would say what he really wants to say, they would be confused and look at him and say, well, that's not what I meant to ask you. You don't understand my question. So he is insecure about how he would answer. And if he answered truthfully or answered fully, the, the women would be confused. It's, it's just bad news for him all around. All right, next stanza. And would it have been worth it 
After all, would it have been worth while? After the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, all these details from the social gathering, and this and so much more, it is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worth it while if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all, that is not what I meant at all. Now he's throwing rhyme in here, but here we have repetition as well as rhyme. It's like he keeps circling back to this problem, like, well, okay, well, maybe there's a way to make these social situations work. Maybe I need to say this or do that. And he thinks, well, would it have been worthwhile if I had tried to say just what I mean? But he says it's impossible to do that, especially if the audience would just again say, oh, that's not what I meant at all. He is quite certain that he will be misunderstood. Now he says, no. So the question for a while has been, would it have been worth it? And so his answer is no, it would not have been worth it. I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. So he's going to refer to Hamlet here, and also the lord who attends to the king in the play Hamlet, whose name is Polonius. And Polonius is not a very likable character. He He's in a respectable role, but he does some mean stuff in the play, and he's not well-liked, and he's kind of wordy and long-winded, and people think of him as a bit of a fool. Uh, he takes himself too seriously. So that guy has some parallels to this speaker, Polonius and this speaker. And he says, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Am an attendant lord. And he means to say, I am an attendant lord. But he leaves off the I. And some scholars have said, well, that's because he has such a weak sense of self or ego that he doesn't assert himself even enough to use the word I. Am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, differential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost, at times, the fool. So that's a little summary of Polonius's characteristics and also the speakers. He's saying, well, I'm not the main character of a play. I'm more like the secondary character who is a little obtuse and, and is almost a fool and is glad to be of use but isn't the hero. And this is how he sees himself, doesn't see himself in a good light. Now he says, I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Now, I've read that this is a style that young people are wearing at this time period. So maybe he's saying, I'll try out this new new clothing style so that I look younger. Um, but whatever it is, this rolling of the trousers doesn't seem like it's going to fix the problems <laughs> that he has, that this lack of confidence and, and this obtuseness and all that. Now we're getting close to the end. Shall I part my hair behind? Now he's thinking, well, that might help. You know, that'll cover up the bald spot or something. He's worried about aging, right? He's worried about death, as, as we keep saying. Do I dare to eat a peach? Now he's thinking of doing something that, that people full of life would do. Eat a peach. Savor it. And peaches are also associated with femininity and savoring sensuality as well. And he has trouble with that, too. So now he's asking, do I dare eat a peach? Well, my guess is he won't He won't be doing that. I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. Now this sounds kind of positive. Uh, I've heard the mermaids singing. That sounds cool. And for the first time, we're not talking about the, the dirty city, the polluted yellow fog and stuff. The mermaids singing is a kind of mythological image and a natural image out there in the sea. It's a little moment of hope here. But then immediately he says, I do not think that they will sing to me. So whatever the mermaids are singing, he has heard them, 
but they're not going to sing to him. He's going to be left out of that as well. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves, blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. So he has seen the mermaids out there. And that tells us that there is something special about him. And it's too bad that he hasn't been able to express it uh, because he has seen something special. And we wish he could, like Lazarus, come back and tell us all about it. But he says, I have seen them. And then here's the last three lines. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. A sad ending here. He's, he's saying that we, and now he's trying to involve us, the reader, again, or maybe his companion, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea. So if we've been in that subterranean level, that low down, whether it's the Dante's hell that mentioned at the beginning and, and the low things mentioned throughout the poem, now they're in the sea chambers, like underwater caves. And he says, we've lingered there. Now, is that a metaphor for the unconscious, for the, the creative artist who goes down into the imaginative depths of his psyche? It seems like he's had some kind of experience that is like exploring the underwater caves, and he has lingered there, and in these underwater chambers, there are sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown. So they have the seaweed, they have life. The seaweed is, is not dead, but alive, unlike so much of the other imagery that's dealing with death and so on. It's contact with, with life, and yet they're mermaids, so it almost feels like an imaginary life or the underground source of life. He has lingered there. But then human voices wake us. So they were lingering there until human voices woke them and we drown. So they were underwater and it was okay until they woke up and now they drown because you can't be underwater while you're awake. Once regular life comes in, you cannot maintain the imaginative life. Or maybe it's like the human voices are the calls upon you, the duties of the world, or the social constraints. The human voices could be any kind of call that comes from the regular world outside of this mythical sea chamber place. And when you realize that that's there, the real world is there, it, then you drown. That, that is, you cannot maintain your existence down in that realm, whatever it is whether it's the imagination or the psyche, the unconscious, whatever, it cannot be maintained. We can't stay there. This is his sad ending, I guess, is that he can't quite make it in the human world, and yet he can't stay in his own mental world or his imagination world either, because uh, the human voices do wake us and we drown. Well, I hope this helps you understand the poem a bit more. We could analyze lots of other aspects of the poem. But as far as a first reading through, this is a, a good start. And I hope you'll join me for another video sometime.